All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Ah. Not great. <laughs> Something to work with. That, that really makes Matt, it difficult Matt. for me when you do that instead of snap. It does yeah. it? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Matt, Matt gets attacked by a big bug every time. I about to snap and he gets scared. I didn't know that made it harder for you, Chris. I won't do it anymore. <laughs> just, we we such a, just... He's such a fucking diva. <laughs> uh, I think it's funny because we, we all clap and smack at the same time and then Matt just goes, Ow! <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just easier to use my mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isolate that. I guess just to uh, usually kink kick things off here. Um, uh, greetings, listeners. Uh, I wish I could come to you today to, you know, share in a happy April Fool's Day and wish you all a happy April Fool's Day. But unfortunately, the April Fool, the beloved jester and prankster and national hero who this day is dedicated to, has succumbed to the ravages of COVID-19. Wow. There is, no, there is no more April Fool, but uh, we have got uh, in his place uh, Tim Heidecker. Hey, it's Tim <laughs> Heidecker, the the annual fool. Every month is a fool. I'm a fool every month. Every single month of the year, I'm the fool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I can make you boys laugh with one, with two words. Ready? Just get your serious. Okay. Um, turkey wings. (laughs) 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 Oh God! You know what? It's not so bad. It's not so bad that the April Fool is dead. His shit was kind of an old hat anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I I never wanted to like criticize him because he was sort of a veteran of show business, but we're not missing much. Much, you yeah. Know, you know, I did an April Fool's Day prank on my m- mom who's staying with our family right now. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, it's pretty good. Of course, pretty good. <laughs> she, I, I have a six year old, and we conspired together this morning to hide the eggs in the ha- in the in the fridge. And then my daughter asked my gr- my my mother to make her uh, French toast. So my mom went looking for the eggs, which were there last night. We had a big carton of eggs in the fridge. But they were gone missing, and we were running all over the house looking for the eggs and getting mad about it. I was yelling at my wife, where the hell are the eggs? How could they just disappear? But it was just a spoof. It was a spoof. It was a goof. Classic. <laughs> See, and that, that's the fact that you, like, got the kids involved. It's like genetic languages. Some things can yeah. only be passed down in that way. And that's, like, how, like, one, one generation is the annual fool and they pass it down. But my daughter called it Happy Prank Day, which I, like... I like that as as far as the April Fools, because that's, that's not very nice to the fools out there. Well, it is. That is like a happy holidays type thing, and you know, hopefully, <laughs> like in the second, second term, Trump takes this on. Like, no offense. Nobody's to saying audience, April but. Fools anymore, <laughs> folks. Nobody's We're saying April Fools. Is. We're bringing back the fools, all of them. <laughs> Look at I'll up, be the folks. first president. I'll be the first president since James Buchanan to have a jester. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like today, today's April Fool's. It's like, you know, it, you know, it is a it is a classic holiday for, you know, radio shock jock personalities like us. But, yeah. you know, now now, especially because you can do those classic April Fool's prank where you like call people and be like, uh, hello, this is the hospital. You've uh, you're going to die of the coronavirus. And then, you know, that's <laughs> a, just a classic bit you can do now. Yeah, you could do. um well, this was that was like an Opie and Anthony special. Like it would be April Fools, and it'd be like the mayor's dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is your doctor some... calling. <laughs> There's some terrible news. I once called my cousin on like it was we were the same age, and we'd both gotten into college, and it was our first week in school. And I called her as the dean of admissions from this other school that she applied to but didn't accept or whatever, and was like, "This is." I don't understand. You're supposed to be in. You're supposed to be here today, and I was like really upset with her that she wasn't at our college, and she was freaked. She just didn't understand. No, I said I wasn't going to your school. I don't understand why this is happening, and then it was just a crank. 
Do you guys want to hear more prank calls? Do you guys want to hear more prank calls I've done in my life? Of course. So interesting. So well, interesting maybe, to hear about. Let's, let's do some. Let's do some pranks right now. Like where we, uh, I don't know, make an announcement that schools are officially open and kids can leave the house and you know right, go that, play outside yeah. with their friends and things like that. You no, yeah, do it on your podcast. Yeah, exactly. I think you've given away the plot a little bit there, but yeah. good luck to you. Uh, I've heard of a, there's a new mask, the new mask everyone should be wearing for maximum uh, uh, security. Our company is selling it, uh, our company is, uh, our new sponsor, they're 100% bat wing masks. <laughs> they provide 100% protection against COVID-19. They come from uh, from uh, uh, distributors uh, in certain parts of China that I will not uh, name right now, but 100% bat wing protect you against all uh, diseases. Uh, all they're right, saying if you those. eat just a little, you, they're saying that they recommend you should eat a little, just a little bat. <laughs> just a little, <laughs> little bat. Yeah. Yeah, it builds up your tolerance. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. The problem is um, you eat too much bat. You got to just have a little bit, a little bit of bat. Yeah, no, it's like drinking. It's like anything else. Yeah. Like they say it's even like, like pregnant women should eat like, like half a bat wing a day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I saw Geraldo recommending that on the Twitter. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, have a, I have a prank. Uh, I think it, this is this is for like you know people more of my generation like the internet age. All right, you know Chris obviously edited around this. We really want this prank to like just be a national sensation. Okay, you know as the man said in the song, y'all ready for this? Okay, uh, okay. So we have there's new audio of Donald Trump really screwing the pooch on COVID nineteen. If you want to hear it, go to YouTube.com/slash Watch Question Mark V equals <laughs> DQW4W9WGXCQ. Uh, all right, Chris. Uh, just putting the putting this here. You can edit this out later. That's of course the URL for the classic Rick Roll. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, some people are going to be upset. Ah, ah. Yeah, this is going to be a classic. It's along similar lines of a, a bat wing um, a respirator masks. Uh, did you see today that um, Elon Musk promised to like give states like thousands of ventilators and then Amazing. he just bought them CPAP machines with yep. the Tesla logo on it. Yep. And like CPAP machine will spread the virus. Yes. Like it's the it's, opposite. It aerosolizes but, it. And it also yeah. is not a ventilator. It doesn't intubate. No, I do love yeah. the idea that somebody is like they're drowning in their own phlegm and you go, look, you, I, 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 uh, bad news is we have no way to stop you from drowning on your own uh, sputum. Good news, you'll never snore again. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like somebody who has malaria, and you're like, I have the perfect thing for you. I got you a hot tub. <laughs> enjoy, <laughs> enjoy just marinating in that diarrhea until you die. And didn't didn't he uh, wasn't he like two weeks ago saying that this pandemic is dumb or something? Like, oh yeah, it was not that long. Yeah, ago. yeah, yeah. Three no, weeks yeah. ago, maybe I'll give him that. Oh yeah, but still, by then it was pretty clear to most people reading the news that well he resisted he resisted for a very long time closing the tesla plants and he actually tried to get tesla cl classified as an essential service so they couldn't close the factory and my mom just told me this is coming from my mom who got this on facebook so just that's a big warning here <laughs> you might want to put <laughs> but i think it was from somebody she knew her she said her husband works in pennsylvania at a office office furniture uh, store like they sell office furniture and they were trying to get him to come back into work <laughs> and they're trying to classify oh, it as God. a essential service it's like it's, well, it's office for nothing's what do you why would you need office furniture right now well you know we actually just on our most recent episode we had a uh um uh, a nurse from oakland uh we interviewed them about you know what it's like sort of uh, you know, on the front lines of this crisis. Yeah. And he said, like, the number one thing hospitals need right now are, like, reclining office chairs. Right. Or those glass things that you put under the seat so you can roll around. Yes, yes, So that you're, exactly. not, you're not dragging you're not getting, on the carpet. You're not getting dragged, yes, catching up and ruining the carpet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, the factories that make those uh, the little uh, desktop pool tables, those are still going. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, Father's Day is coming up, and Dads are going to need those regardless of the coronavirus. Oh, God, those Father's Day gifts. You're right. Yeah. In the front part of Macy's. Yes. That's that's going to, they're going to be really decimated this year. <laughs> like the Funko Pops. Yeah. This is, I mean, you know, who's, who's on the front lines as always? Fathers. <laughs> First one's in, last one's out. But one father, everyone, everyone, everyone leaves them behind. One father, one riot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I would think this would be beautiful. I and because it's my favorite. I think that 
if we could be open by Father's Day, wouldn't that be beautiful? Wouldn't that be something special? <laughs> well, we all could the families all, to come together. All the fathers. We could all we can all be grilling, and we could just pat our dads on the back and thank them for all the work they've done. And I think that would be that's my favorite holiday, Father's Day. Absolutely. <laughs> that's the thank you to all the fathers. That is that's a cool type of guy. A guy who doesn't have kids. And he's like, yeah, my favorite day, uh, Father's Day, it's the best one. <laughs> I just respect those men so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just goes up to any guy who who looks like he has kids. Thank you. <laughs> I think it'll be funny. They keep interviewing Trump, and he keeps pushing it to different holidays. So it's like, <laughs> I, in my mind, and this is just me. I mean, the doctors may say one thing, but for me, beautiful time would be Labor Day. Wouldn't that be something? It's sort of the end of summer. It's sort of, uh, it's back to school. I mean, wouldn't that be beautiful? I mean, we don't know. It might not be. It might be well past beyond that. It might be Valentine's Day 2021. But <laughs> if we could, I'd love to see that. Wouldn't that be beautiful, uh, Labor Day? I want to see every, everyone Valentine's Day, February next year. Everyone will be kissing each other. I want to kiss festival. <laughs> I, I think everyone's uh, kissing. I think, we have so many. We have so many wonderful Albanian Americans. You know, by the end of November, we're gonna have Albanian Independence Day. You know, everyone <laughs> remembers that day at fourteen forty three. It's so beautiful, <laughs> and it's gonna be a whole. It's a whole big. It's gonna be a whole big beautiful thing. The bird's gonna be everywhere. Everyone's gonna be flying the bird, and then you know, okay, you know, maybe okay. It's a great day, Albanian Day. Albanian Day. Everyone loves it. But if we don't, it's not. It you know, it's not done uh, by then. Maybe Purim. What about, well, this? <laughs> what about this list? You know, we had a, we had a beautiful one of really a special leap day this year, uh, just a, a one of a kind 2020 <laughs> leap year, uh, February, end of February. I think if we could get things working by the next leap year, that would be really something special. <laughs> wouldn't it? The next wouldn't leap that be day. something? It'd be wonderful. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? A little bit of a nerd? I love pie day. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, it's like uh, speaking of speaking of our, our our leader, our president. Um, like you know, a, a week or so ago, I was like terrified that like the line out of the government and like you know the leaders of industry and finance were just that like yeah, like in two weeks we're just gonna send everyone who's healthy back to work because like the economy is just gotta keep yeah. going. And it seems like they've abandoned that. This yeah, week, I think like someone yeah. got through to it's him just somehow. Like, I don't know how. It's good, but it's also scary because it tells you like how serious this shit actually is. That like even <laughs> I know. yeah, like even, that even they, they couldn't convince him to yeah. Dullard, who's been just freaking out about his precious stocks. But uh, like, for like the what's past so weeks. fucking like what's so fucking insane though is like, and this is almost like hack to point out, but like three weeks ago, which I know seems like three years now that we're in this like in year zero, but he was saying it was like a hoax. Yep. Yeah. They're like he was saying, that, like it's it's the media, it's a hoax against Trump because I'm doing so good. And then after that, he said we've got it contained. And then after that, he said only 22 people have died and like you know millions going to be down to zero diarrhea every year. And then just yesterday at the press conference, he said, "Look, if less than 200 thousand people die, it's a win. It's an unambiguous W for us." I thought it was such a stupid, stupid thing to start bringing up, like H one N one and um, whatever the like the the uh, Ebola, Sword SARS or Ebola. So, yeah. It's like because we all are adults that lived through that and know and remember that we didn't stop going to work and we didn't stop. We didn't like my kids didn't stop going to school or you know what I mean. Like bringing up like empirical things that happened in our very recent past that we can now compare this to. Which it's like no, you can't tell the most diehard Trump supporter. You remember those? That remember when that H one N one hit and it just decimated the country? <laughs> Is it yeah. just, no, nobody fucking remembers or cares about that. I mean, I'm sure it's terrible. Some people died, and and we hate when people die. I mean, we really hate it. But right, isn't it crazy? Like, I, don't give us an example of something that worked out reasonably well. Like Ebola did not become a national tragedy right like we know yeah whatever happened they handled it appropriately as far as i can remember unless they've er erased our minds i mean i i think well the last thing you said i mean i think like people like you like people you know people who like pay, pay a lot of attention and like are constant 
consumers or like reasonably high volume consumers of media will remember. They do remember H1N1. They do remember Ebola. But for all intents and purposes, like most people's minds are wiped. Like the speed of the yeah. news cycle and the way that we process events is completely cancerous and uh, destroys any ability to retain information or have any like context for things that have happened, even in the right. last six years. And yeah, like people who would never vote for Trump, like a lot of them remember it. They were they're like, oh yeah, there was no like national lockdown for Ebola. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? But his base, like that. The point of like the point of him saying that isn't to like convince everyone. It's to convince like it, it's like to give his base something to say, and then to give like undecided voters who like a lot. Like I'd say, like probably most people in this country have like no real frame of reference for events that take place because of like. I mean, a lot of reasons, like a, because of like how little free time they have compared to other people B, right. how bad our media is and how like poisonous the way that we determine news cycles are. They're like, oh yeah. I mean, was it that bad? I mean, I guess. Yeah. Well, somebody yeah. made a, a good point. I don't know who it was online, but they were saying how re the, the reality is most people get their news from local news. Like they l yeah. put on the local news channel and there it is. And they get like the. You know, most of the things that are important to them are the stuff happening around their their community, um, and that the fact that they're preempting these these local news broadcasts with these nightly Trump uh, rally uh, press conferences um, is that a lot of people are getting like the main source of information from those insane uh, you know uh, monologues at the lectern. So yeah, I guess you're you're right. Is they are they are going to be able to shape the narrative for a lot of people and you know that's why according to opinion polls 60 percent of america approves of trump's handling of this of coronavirus pandemic which is astonishing well they're not dead yet he's doing a good <laughs> yeah. job i mean honestly i like i think a lot of this is just because it's still it's, it doesn't feel like it but it's still incredibly early days and you're not hearing so much about the swine flu this week as you were last week because it doesn't make any sense now it was just a thing to say it was just a thing <laughs> to say. Like three weeks time. ago, three weeks ago, when it was still like, what's happening? You're like, well, look, fucking uh, swine flu killed all these people. Nobody said anything. Uh, liberal bias. But now you're like, well, what about that? And it's like, oh, I never said that. What, what's the swine flu? Who are you? I can't taste anything. <laughs> I mean, uh, Trump it's said, just Trump it's said, a constant moment, momentary screaming present. Triage. It's just yeah, yeah like tr just stop the bleeding. Keep yeah, keep, just keep, keep talking. Distracted. Just keep talking. Uh, I think yeah. Mike Pence. Mike Pence was interviewed like yesterday or this morning, and was like asked about like all of Trump's incredibly like you know either downplaying it, outright denying it, or like his rosy you know uh, scenarios about like you know how you know how much he got this under control. And Pence said like, look, he was just trying to give people hope. <laughs> he was just trying to you know it's like a pep talk at halftime. You know, it's just like I know it looks bad. Well, his but... new thing, this is amazing, and he it, it, it was it's a switch almost overnight from this is a hoax or it's overblown by the media to make Trump look bad to now they brought out that chart and then, and he's like, look, to, it could be a million's dead, but here we're gonna get it down here and what a hundred thousand, and if we do that, I like I think I think it did a good about, job. What about the shtick where he was like? Uh, um, a lot of people were saying we should just ride it out. We shouldn't do anything. <laughs> Which yes. was literally what he was, <laughs> yeah, was you. That was, just, that, was you. that was you. That was only you talking he, into the mirror. <laughs> you know, you know, he 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 said I was one of the only ones standing up against like the some very very loud, very prominent voices. You just wanted people to go back to work, and like it was no big deal. Yeah, it's just him watching like Sean Hannity and talking to Sean Hannity through the tv no sean i don't know about this one sean yeah that's literally just yeah his argument with larry kudlow and he way he won that <laughs> argument because larry kudlow like fell down face first into his rolodex he's, he still uses <laughs> that because he's 85 years old but when he came out there with that with that chart others have said this but it's just just uh, stunning he basically pitched it as like he made a deal with the virus <laughs> like the virus He's like, wants to kill two, three million people. I say hundred thousand bet last offer, and they took it, folks. They took the deal. Look at me. Yeah, Look yeah. At the deal I made. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like that, that horrific, like black, like um, yeah. like 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 bell curve kind of graph or whatever. It's like it's oh, terrifying it's to look at. Yeah. It's all blacked it, out. It looks like, like death himself. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Put a couple <laughs> yeah. Eyes and a skull in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs>
No, you're Matt. Yeah, he did. He made a deal with the virus. Yeah, you and mean, like, I honestly, did it, folks. Think how good that deal was. And of course, well, he's he, like, and so he's pitching it as if there is end up being like six figure death toll, that's a win, and you have to right. like give him credit for it. Even though the reality is, is that the di- it's not like stopping. Uh, you know, it's you don't give. He wants credit for all those people who are going to die from the projection when really he deserves blame for a huge chunk of those people who did not have to die if they'd taken it all seriously at the beginning. Well, I just, I mean, this is maybe hacky too, but I just, the other day I was like, you know, Trump basically takes a tremendous shit all over the bathroom. I missed the toilet completely. It is the whole floor is filled with my feces and it's diarrhea and it's everywhere and we're doing an incredible job cleaning it up, you know, and we have <laughs> the, best, the best maids, the best people. And we're and, you know, we didn't get it anywhere near the shower and we haven't gotten it anywhere near the sink, but it is all over the floor and it will take a while and it's going to be bad and you're not going to want to go in there for a while. But it's, you know, and, but it's like, yeah, but it was your shit that you missed the toilet, dude. You know, no, no one, no one, no one told us before this. You had too many tried mangoes. <laughs> and it's gonna go everywhere. No one knew that before this. And now it's a very, very, very good thing that we know. If you eat too many dried mangoes, it's gonna yeah. go everywhere. It's gonna come out, and it's gonna come out quickly. And <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna hurt, and it's gonna cramp. Well, I, I, I you know, we we're talking about these, uh, these, these immensely reassuring press conferences that he's doing, and uh, I, I, I would like to move on now to. Uh, so one of them that featured, uh, you know, one of my favorite characters in the in, in the Trump uh, extended universe, and I'll just uh, kick it off uh, by reading from a. Uh, this is a Politico's coverage of uh, a uh, the coronavirus briefing from the other day. So just to begin here, it says uh, President Donald Trump kicked off Monday's press briefing on the coronavirus, much like every other, by running through daily updates about the deadly virus and the White House efforts to eradicate it. But unlike typical briefings throughout the pandemic in which various members of the administration discuss what their agencies are doing to combat the virus or help blunt its economic toll, Trump yielded the stage to a handful of business leaders, one of them a staunch supporter who went off script in a moment of effusive praise for the president. Going, Continuing, it says here, only one of the executives got a particularly glowing introduction from the president. A friend of mine, Mike Lindell of My Pillow. Boy, you, do you sell those pillows? <laughs> Trump said of Lindell, <laughs> who sat in front of the front row chair set up by the White House Rose Garden. It's unbelievable what you do. When the president beckoned the executive, it's not like, unbelievable what you do. He has a company <laughs> called MyPillows.com. <laughs> he makes he sells pillows. Who cares? Pillows, they're basic pillows, folks. Well, I mean, he built a company that actually makes money, so Trump is astounded by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my pillow. My my pillow is one of the only successful American manufacturing companies. Yeah, it's anymore. like. Wait a minute. The pillows. So when he talks to the pillow guy, he must just be like, "So you actually make the pillows, and people buy them? <laughs> they don't throw your you don't don't stamp people, your uh, name on it. Yeah, they don't give people chiggers or something. I don't understand. No, you're you're right. Actually, like. As as buffoonish as Mike Lindell is, I essentially Trump is wowed by it because he makes a product that he sells to people for like you know a a, a profit, but like essentially delivers a pillow to them yeah. instead of instead Scamming of like them. just selling them a pillow and then like giving them like like nails or like yeah. a flyer in the mail to <laughs> buy another you pillow or something like you that. You don't promise to deliver a pillow and then don't, <laughs> but take the money anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, continuing here, it says here. Uh, when the president beckoned to the executives uh, as the lectern to say a few words, sorry, a few words about their efforts, up first was Lindell, a major Republican donor, the Trump campaign's chairman for Minnesota, and someone who has called Trump the greatest president in American history, and someone who was chosen by God. But his mm. remarks went beyond the polite accolades and brief summary of steps his company is taking to assist other corporations in preparing to weather future pandemics. After explaining that MyPillow was dedicating three-fourths of its manufacturing capabilities to produce cotton face masks for healthcare providers and studying how to help companies rebound from the economic standstill, Lindell asked whether it would be okay to read something he'd written off the cuff. God gave us grace on November 8th, 2016 to change the course we are on, Lindell began, referencing the day Trump was elected president. Taken out of our schools and lives, a nation had turned its back on God. Lindell then offered advice to families stuck at home because of various social distancing guidelines. I encourage you to use this time at home to get back in the word, read our Bibles, and spend time with our families. Our president gave us so much hope. 
where just a few short months ago we had the best economy, the lowest unemployment, and wages going up. It was amazing, he continued, as Trump stood behind him expressionless. With our great president, <laughs> vice president, and this administration, and all the great people in this country praying daily, we will get through this and back to a place that's stronger than ever, stronger and safer than ever. So uh, Trump then said, uh, I did not know he was going to do that, but he is a friend of mine, and I do appreciate it. So... Strong praise would, there for the president from my, the My Pillow guy. My Pillow guy, I was just looking this up, is located in Minnesota. Yeah. I assume that's maybe where Mark lives. Uh, yeah, was, yeah, 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 yes. Uh, my, Mike Lindell, he was. Mike Lindell, did I say Mark? He, he was. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, he's a Minnesotan. He'd let you say that for two years and then be like, the whole time I've been meaning to tell you it's actually Mike, but I'm sorry for correcting you. No, but how Mike did he get Mike? Well, let me ask a quick, quick question, you guys. Maybe it's a simple answer, but how did he get to the White House? Like, who's, what, what did he fly? Uh, what did he take a, a flight to DC? Like, I don't that's know. Should we all yeah. be, not be traveling he, around? Yeah, that's a good he question, took, he, actually. He, he, took the, he took the My Pillow Comanche <laughs> helicopter, one of the only commissioned Comanche helicopters in the world anymore, and My Pillow <laughs> owns it. I like to think uh, that he flies around in a giant Zeppelin shaped like one of his like a pillow. signature pillows. <laughs> <laughs> but have any of you guys had, have ever had any experiences with the My Pillow? Like, what what makes them? Special? I tried it years ago. And I thought it was awful. <laughs> I really well, like, did. Well, wait, really how did. is it different than other pillows? It was like it's like packing foam. It's like uh, <laughs> it's like pack yeah, like that popcorn styrofoam sort of feeling. Some people love it. But well, I didn't. It was not for me. Just just to get into it a little bit, I'm I, I'm looking on the website for mypillow.com, and you know, sort of part of the success of the company is the success. Like Mike Lindell is like a very front facing, you know, oh yeah, executive or owner of the company. Yeah. It's like he, he's selling him. He's, he's like selling Colonel him. Sanders. Yes, exactly. He's the he, Colonel. In, Sanders uh, in the commercials pillow. for the pillow, he's always holding the pillow in front of him yeah. and squeezing, and he's it. got the cross coming out over his his button up shirt. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah the... He he is he is a modern Templar, <laughs> a warrior of Christ. Uh, you know, deeply like deeply involved in protecting Christians, and in, like an intelligent operator for sure, but a man with a mission. Are you guys and on the website? It's hilarious. Yeah, it's no, like I'm on the website really here. Funny website. Yeah, no, I, I'm not. Like the, the, the front page of the website is probably 50 different pictures of Mike Lindell holding pillows yeah. or talking to various yeah. conservative talk radio yeah. guys. One of them yeah. is him asleep on one of his pillows with his <laughs> eyes closed. It's so creepy. He looks dead. Mike oh, Lindell. This is a great website. This is this is like this is like the website for a Central Asian dictator. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, Mike Lindell is unfortunately he's gonna meet a fate similar to Jacques de Molay. Uh during the reign of Donald Trump Jr., he will be the crown will be in debt to my pillow. <laughs> Trillions of dollars of debt to my pillow, the only remaining business. Do you guys he will guys, accuse Mike Lundell of sodomy and burn him at the stake in the Rose Garden. <laughs> Mike look Lundell at will curse the Trump dynasty. Look at that third square underneath the sleeping Mike Lindell. It's him on. We're talking to the Mike Gallagher radio specials. Yes, yes. It looks like he's talking to Paul Simon. Doesn't it look like he's talking? To <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Tim, the, the section of the website that I, I wanted to share with you guys is uh, Mike's story, which is a big part of my pillow. And there's sort of like a a timeline that gives you the, the story of Mike's whole life and the foundation, you know, the founding of my pillow. Is so that it, on this site somewhere? If you click. Yes, around? it is. Yeah, if you, if you can find it. Uh, but it begins here in 1977, the beginning. It reads here in his teenage years, Mike had problems sleeping. His pillow would get hot. He would toss and turn at night and wake up with a sore arm and stiff neck. He decided to spend one of his entire paychecks on a pillow. At the time, Mike was working at a grocery store and drive-in movie theater. He thought if the pillow was expensive, it had to be good. So that, that was the beginning of his pillow journey was, um, you know, I mean, we all, we all have that problem, right? Like the side of the pillow yeah. that your head is on is, gets hot, and then you want My that My wife cool... was complaining about pillows the other night. She's saying, I'm, I'm waking up with... With uh, neck pain, and I just I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, and then, and then in 1980, the headline here is Entrepreneurial Path. It says Mike began his entrepreneurial path early on by starting his own carpet cleaning business. From there, he purchased his own lunch wagon and then went on to own several bars and restaurants. And then it jumps ahead to 2004. 
Having been turned down, Mike knew he needed to find a way to sell his product, not only to help people sleep better, but also to provide for his family. He had sold his business and was all fully invested in the pillow. Mike suggests, a, a friend suggested he try and sell his pillows from a kiosk in a mall. Unsure of how even to spell the word, Mike gave it a go. Wait, unsure how, oh, I guess kiosk is the word he was <laughs> unsure of how to spell. I thought it might be pillow for a second. Uh, <laughs> Mike gave it a go. It was not the great success he had hoped for. However, one pillow was sold to a customer who ran a local home and garden show. The customer liked the pillow so much, he called Mike and offered him a spot in the show. Under the headline, developing the pillow. By this point in Mike's life, he had tried every pillow on the market, but nothing worked. I doubt that. One night. <laughs> one night you know how many Mike pillows he... are on the market? Give me a break. Will you One, should tell you, Will you should um pr like put a little thing in before you, this chunk of the show starts saying if you are having trouble sleeping this is a good cue up to this point <laughs> to hear the my pillow story. <laughs> well, this is where it gets exciting actually. So uh, this okay, will get you back. Sorry. Here. One but one night, Mike had a dream. In it, in it was the idea of inventing his own pillow. He wasted no time and began to work on a prototype and logo. It took My about God, a year's this is time. Like the Angel Moroni visiting Joseph Smith. No, this is, I, this is no. You are right. This is the only thing that could replace Mormonism as the American. By religion. the way, I have some news on on this guy, but I'll, t I'll that'll be a tease. I'll give it to you after you finish the story. I have some breaking news on him. That I just got. Sent it just me. it says here it took about a year's time until he finally had invented the perfect pillow. Mike was excited and ready to get it to the masses. He went to major box stores expecting them they would want to carry his product. He got turned down by them all. I mean it goes on like this, but what I enjoy about it is like a, a big part of this story is that like Mike has had trouble sleeping his entire life and like no <laughs> pillow could like he just couldn't get a good night's sleep. He was always waking up tired and sore or whatever. The other big part of the Mike Lindell story is that he was addicted to cocaine and crack for like 20, 30 uh. years. So I think maybe <laughs> that contributed somewhat to his, like, you know, having a difficulty going to sleep. If you've been like, you know, smoking bass for six hours straight, you might not get the, the best night's sleep. Maybe he's also like, you know, he's at the, on the outside, he's super Christian and he's like really identifies as a Christian. But at night, he's just like, rolling over in his head like none of this makes any sense what have i done this whole this whole god jesus concept like he can't really his the back of his brain is just not um not there but here's the news ready yeah this came in from a trusted source um that the better business bureau has given mike an f oh no business practices. <laughs> <laughs> well this oh, is god. like this is exactly, you know, what the French state did to the Templars. <laughs> well, I, I mean, when I was uh, looking into Mike Lindell, I think it was uh, he is currently being sued by like a state attorney general for <laughs> making claims in my pillow ads that they cure sleep apnea and like fibromyalgia. Yeah, and so right. like a lot of the people who've been defending uh, the my pillow butt guy being at the thing, they're saying, well, he was there because he's announcing that his factory is going to make a bunch of uh, masks, and don't you feel like an asshole? Because what are you doing? He's building masks. Like I don't trust the fucking my pillow guy's mask. <laughs> yes, no, of course no. not. He's a fucking scam not. artist. Like he said, yeah, he's going to turn over like seventy percent of his manufacturing capacity to make like you know uh, like PPEs for healthcare workers. Like you know. On its face, good. Like basically every factory in America should be doing that. But like, what are these masks he's going to turn out? They're just going to be the my pillow material, but you can put something you can strap to your face. Like I guarantee. Also, you don't assume. Don't assume he's going to be doing anything. Like you should assume yeah. that he's not going to do anything based on his record and the people he associates with. Like assume he's that there, you can't believe anything the guy says. So well, maybe show uh, us them. Show us the masks first. Apparently, I mean, then maybe uh, take it. Trump and people in the white house are trying to get him to run for governor of minnesota he may he may win i mean minnesota has gone from a reliably blue state to like you know in a good year it could be a solid republican state a republican could win that by like six seven points uh but well they, they will after, get, you, after you quit the podcast to become mike lindell's campaign manager <laughs> well i just okay look i like that mike lindell he he holds down carver county Every you know everyone everyone coming from Minnesota they 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 come from a place like Edina or you know White Bear Lake they come from a place with like you know higher household income you know less less dire Carver is a dire place did you know this about Mike Lindell that according to the Mike Lindell legend 
his crack dealers staged an intervention for him. Yes. To stop using yes. crack. Really? Yeah, like, he's a legend. Mike Lindell is a legend. There are a lot of like. He's a survivor. Uh, yeah, he's a survivor. And it's like, look, you guys know I love the replacements. But who like carries on the legacy of the replacements quite like Mike Lindell? It's <laughs> How a so? Party. It, it's a, well, it's a swinging party. And we're bringing our pillows. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's like <laughs> definitely like he, he definitely like lived the rock and roll lifestyle. But he also, like, he also, um, you know, he gives you, like, sort of slices of dire Minnesota life. But unlike the replacements, he's giving you, uh, like, more of a message of hope. Um, he should, I, I hope he that, runs against Garrison that, Keillor. That would be perfect. That would That is the election that Minnesota deserves. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think Jesse Ventura should run again. Absolutely. I think Ventura is the only candidate who could beat Lindell. He should be. Uh, he's going to be my presidential candidate for this time, for sure. Where is he at uh, philosophically these days? Is he like uh, anti-Trump and kind of he doesn't like uh, Trump. Uh, he's like a he's a what do you call it a libertarian, right? I don't know, man. He's a he's he's a he's a a, a, a American. I would say I would put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yep. That is the best way to describe Ventura. That's the best way to describe a lot of people. Where it's like they're a centrist, but in the sense that they have some views that are far far right and some views that are actually left wing. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I'm a moderate. Yeah. No, yeah, he yeah. he is he he's just an American, like like all Americans was a um like sort of comic muscle man in eighties action movies as a character actor, and then like lies about almost everything in his life story. And they got to be governor of Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. Was, that's, was that's he not American like life. was he not a Green Beret? Was that sort of no? Was, yeah, he, was that well, he, 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 he was said he was in the Navy SEALs, but yeah, I mean he he did yeah he did serve. He did but the bus like, training, he, but he wasn't. There was no technically there were no Navy SEALs when he was in it. So oh, he basically yeah. says like I did the same training that SEALs did. And that makes right. me a SEAL. But so he did he, beat he did beat Chris Kyle's uh, widow in the, the his uh, defamation suit. Uh, that was Alpha. You yeah. have to admit that, that was, was incredibly Alpha. alpha. He's like and after like, Chris Kyle died, he was he was in the process of suing him for lying about him in his book, uh, and then after he died, he did not drop the lawsuit because it's like no, I need my name cleared. No, I mean like one of only two men to get a W over Chris Kyle. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> him and that uh, and that uh, other guy in the in the shooting. Right? Yeah, yeah, we know we know it's <laughs> what you're talking about. We know it's what you're talking about. But uh, Felix, back to uh, what you said about like a, a key centerpiece of the Mike Lindell story. Is that he was a drug addict for like decades and then like, you know, is apparently sober now and like, you know, became sober through the power of prayer and Christ. And he lo he likes telling the story a lot about how his like all like the, the four or five guys that he was buying crack from like had an intervention for him where they all came together and they're like, Mike, we're, we're not we're not selling you <laughs> like crack or cocaine anymore. Like you got to get your shit together. I, I mean, obviously, that's a very good story. Those are probably the most, like, you know, ethically minded drug dealers I think I've ever uh, heard of. But I like to imagine they came together and were like, Mike, we can't sell you drugs anymore. Because, like, they were just so sick of hearing about the fucking pillow every time they had to, like, get to pick up. <laughs> yeah. You know? so here's the thing, That's dude. Like, here's the thing. It's like gonna be the. It's gonna be like the best fucking pillow you've ever had, man. It's like it's insane, bro. I I can hear those conversations right now. Now I'm sorry, but I met you. I I know I met you a month ago. But you're the most beautiful fucking guy I've ever met. There aren't a lot of real guys in Mankato. You're a real fucking guy. I love you. Um, can I say also nah, like you're so Christian? I you mean, got your pillows. You, you, you know, like if you're so Christian and everything, like can't can he give like I got those I I'm not and this isn't an ad, but I get those Bombas socks and their whole deal is like we're sending a free pair of socks to like homeless shelters for every sock you buy. Like that seems like what what's Mike Lindell doing with all this these Christian values in his company? Maybe he's giving half of it away, but how how do you why don't you reflect that into your into your business model somehow, Mike? <laughs> no, you don't. Nobody has an answer for that. <laughs> All right, you guys. Sorry, want to I, check derailed, out this? I derailed. I derailed um, the cocaine riffing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. I was just gonna say that. Like, I actually like don't know how Lindell would do for a governor's race in Minnesota. Maybe he'd win. Maybe he wouldn't. I think he kind of has like the characteristics that people like in a potential governor, um, and some characteristics that they don't. I mean, like governors are like they're kind of like the most autonomous uh elected officials in america at the, at the higher level uh they sort of buck parties 
more than senators, more than representatives, more than even presidents. And I think like Lindell would maybe have a problem because he's just like he's just a lockstep Trump Republican. I don't know that people always love that in governors, especially not completely in Minnesota, even though Trump does outperform other Republicans in Minnesota. But Lindell's advantage is his crack addiction, his former crack addiction. <laughs> because, I mean, do you know what they call Minnesota? The, the land of 10,000 re, uh, rehab centers. <laughs> it's the treatment state. It really oh, is. Oh, yeah, it's like, true. And I think, like, if he has any advantage there, it's not really the Trump connection, it's the crack connection. It's oh. it, Minnesota. Minnesota has, like, more industries than a lot of, like, uh, uh, of the true north and a lot of the northern mid midwestern states like places like michigan have been hollowed out places like illinois have been hollowed out and they've been replaced by like you know fucking commodity trading centers like we have in chicago they've been replaced by uh escape rooms like they've done with a lot of detroit <laughs> but minnesota has a lot of a lot of big companies a lot of industries but i would say like if you shut down one what would hurt minnesota the most it would be like if, if people realize that the american model for rehab centers is fucking broken but oh, there might be something there. He might he might have that X factor that gets you elected governor. Uh, I I just like to imagine that like Trump is gonna you know bring together all of the drug dealers that uh, did the intervention for him the first time to sit him down in the room and be like, Mike, we got you off crack. Now we got to get you into politics. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, there are, all the crack dealers ended up working for Trump. <laughs> yeah. And um, well, shit. Larry Kudlow probably has most of their phone numbers in his fucking. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's real. I was laughing about Larry Kudlow relapsing and like trying to tell like a Fox like a Fox News like twenty five year old employee like I can get you coke and he calls a bunch of guys that died in nineteen ninety. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoops! I forgot. He's technically eighty three years old. My bad. Um. All right, do you guys want to watch, uh, you know, speaking of smoking crack, do you want to watch a little of this clip from the, the Mark Levin show on Fox News where he interviews uh, Mike about his, his drug addiction? Of course. Yeah. So let's, let, let's, let's check out a little bit of this clip. We can sort of comment on it as it goes. All right, give me one second to, to, to put this, pull this up. Do we have, we have visual? Yep. yep. Yeah, we have visual. We're just, I'm just looking at all, all of right. your book, all of your bookmarks, Chris, which I'll just say uh, porno, boobs, ass, big yes. asses. Big wet butts <laughs> All right, I'll try to get this at a good level where you can uh, kind of riff over it. Okay. So serious. You see it, Tim? Yep. All right, great. Life, Liberty, and Levin is the name of the show. America, I'm Mark <laughs> Life, Lynn. Liberty, and Mike Levity, Levin. and Levin. We have a great guest, Mike Lindell. How are you, sir? Thanks for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure. Now, we're not doing an infomercial. Right. <laughs> I wanted you on the program because you have... Yeah, an infomercial has higher production values than this portion. <laughs> a lot of our audience members. Um, you're a big Trump supporter. Yes. You are a man of deep Christian faith. Yes. You are a remarkable entrepreneur. He looks like a duller, he doesn't guy. he? Like, yeah, he's guy. fundamentally <laughs> a dumb guy. Yeah, he, look, he looks like he's Oops. got a, a ukulele was, playing uh, a cow uh, with his head. I think my addiction was back I don't, yeah. when I, my I don't want to do too much phrenology on, here, but he has the mouth of an imbecile. I very shy, or I would show up to people, like, do little things like, hey, watch me jump off his, this bus. His book should be called, Oops, and, uh, I Started a Pillow and Company. Um... <laughs> You know, using alcohol first and then uh, got into cocaine. Where How the, old were you when you got into cocaine? 53. Uh, probably late, late teens and, you know, seven, 16, 17. <laughs> and then um, <clears throat> at my five-year reunion, um, every, all my other, you know, everyone's graduated from college or they're starting families or they're, they've uh, kept the same employer. And, I, and I'm there. And I wanted what they want, and I'm there. I, I'm you know, all drunk, and you know, tell them about they own the mafia money for football bets, or jump, you know, jumping out of an airplane, or have and a parachute partially open. The mafia and in fucking Carver, Minnesota. But yeah, everyone knows about the, the Mankato mob. What they did because I wanted what they had, so it became a lot of pains, a lot of inner pain, and then I got into cocaine, and then it was 20 years functioning cocaine addict, and then 10 years crack cocaine. So it was a uh, Long, long, you know. So you're lucky to be alive. Yeah, 40 years of addiction. You know. Yeah. And uh, how did you get out of it? Well, uh, they... Did you ever get out of it? 
Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. You get out of it. Well, I'm I mean, still on not, coke. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not addicted anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, wounds as child, things that happen, or or trauma. You know, and um, that's why veterans can be traumatized later on. Any trauma can manifest into, I believe, addictions into a mass pain. And for me, a lot of things had to happen. You know, I lost uh, a 20-year marriage and had all these things happen in uh, the t- mid 2000s, but. In 2000, there was about three things. You know, you can disagree that. with this guy, so but you can't say that he doesn't spin a beautiful yarn. <laughs> yeah. that this is, this is this the story. This is the story. Thing I had. Now, why would drug dealers do an intervention? Well, here's what happened. Is this Nathan I Lane? 14 days. And I was staying downtown in Minneapolis and a half hour from where I was making uh, or doing pillows in this little schoolhouse. And But I had a warrant out for my arrest and I was going to be found innocent the following Tuesday. What? So I was hiding out down there and you know, I come out of the room and three three of the biggest Rum. dealers, I didn't even know they knew each other. And I said, what are you guys doing? And the one guy goes, Mike's been up for 14 days. We're shutting him <laughs> off. And and the guy, the one guy goes, he looks at me like, what's the matter with you? And he says, you ain't getting anything from my guys. And he leaves. The other guy. Oh, wait a minute. No. So up for 14 days. So you were you were using, and they even said, that's enough. <laughs> we're going to cut my, they must have liked you. Yeah, well, here's they wanted what, to save your yeah, life. Yeah, here's what, here's what he said, actually. Um, yeah, they, they all like me, but here's what they said. They thought the that, they were, I was the best crack user they'd ever seen. On the streets and shut off what he, his people. They said, Mike, all your ideas for restaurants <laughs> are great. <laughs> he, he finally went to sleep. I ran out of crack, and I am doing one of these numbers, and I headed down to the streets in Minneapolis about 2.30 in the morning. Couldn't get drugs anywhere, and I went out. I was very resourceful, nothing. I come back upstairs all defeated, and he's standing there waiting up for me, and he says, he says, man, give me that phone. He says, I'm going to take a picture of you. He says, you're going to need it for that book you've been bragging about, telling us you're going to write. <laughs> and he said, you've been telling us for years this my pillow is just a platform for God, and you're going to come back someday and help us out of this addiction and all the dealings that we have. And he says, we're not going to let you die on us. Because I would always tell these guys all the time, you guys, this pillow is just a platform for God. So is it? <laughs> Wait, pause it, pause it, pause it. Okay. So, so we got a lot of the, the the intervention story, which is even better than it. You know, it, it sounds just like on the my drug dealers did an intervention for me. Okay, this guy was up for fourteen days straight doing crack. Like that is really that's impressive. And then also, it's like you were saying, like it, 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 the fact that like high all the time and then like like classic cocaine mania. Telling your drug dealers that the pillow that you're working on in a schoolhouse while you hide out from the fucking cops for something you're going to be declared innocent of at a future date is just <laughs> the pillow. The pillow is just a platform for God. Yeah, that that is some impressive cocaine mania. <laughs> I'm starting to think this guy's a little bit of a treatment warrior because like, indeed, you guys get that sense that he's like a little dishonest. He's one of those guys who is just like mostly like doing crack alone but he's like yeah and i was actually the most famous crack user in the city <laughs> and the way that i did crack made everyone love me but i also did the most crack out of anyone <laughs> and so they were like um like you could do you're actually one of the only guys who could do crack again when he's 70 but you have to stop now because you're going to be such a good guy <laughs> people like, need your people pillow are, like, oh, like, okay people like, need your pillow <laughs> like the way the way that he glossed out like he's such a minnesota guy like he's so, like that is the X factor to him. The part, the parts of his life that he gl- just glosses over, where he's like, and you know, I had a twenty year marriage, and I uh, unfortunately we don't have that anymore. And like, like it, it's, I was where, terribly, it, where, I was terribly uh, physically abusive, but we don't go into that. Part. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like there's just so much that's like weirdly glossed over. That it's like it's the mark of someone who's not totally honest all the time, but so their meter of what's important and what is it is totally off. Like the part about like his marriage falling apart, he's just like, yeah, you know, you'll win some, you'll lose some. <laughs> but just like the specific conversation with the crack dealer where they're like, Mike, you're also gonna be the greatest author of all time. You're going you're you're actually Mike, me and the other crack dealers were talking. They said that you have a writing style actually quite similar to Richard Yates, but Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Like, okay, man. I love his comment about how, like, all the dealers loved him. Because, like, yeah, 
that's what uh, crack dealers really like is uh, spending a lot of time talking to their fucking clients about a book they're going to write one day. <laughs> and like that they uh, uh, that they did an intervention for him because they're like, uh, Mike, you're the greatest crack smoker probably in the history of this state. But like if you don't stop now, like you could die. And we just want you to keep putting up real like big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the perfect like crystallized 100 percent Bolivian flake uh, American Protestantism of going the the pillow it's a, it's just a it's a platform for god and what is god like in god's intervention in the world is what is it it's to get him rich making a shitty pillow for people that they're mostly probably not even going to like yeah that is like you know calvin himself would blush at this this is like <laughs> This is prosperity, you know, prosperity. What's that called? Prosperity, the prosperity gospel, baby. Yeah, prosperity gospel. But this is even beyond that because prosperity gospel, like most of the time, what it means is like God. Like for most people, it's like, oh, God wants you to be like a shitty middle manager who like flips houses. But for God to want you to make a specific pillow is the most insane fucking ideology I've ever heard, and it's. Yeah, again, this is the only thing that could actually replace Mormonism. So respect again to Mike Lindell. All right, let's, wa let's just watch a little bit more of this clip because I also like also I'd like to just credit uh, Lindell is is great, but like the the contrast between him and Mark Levine is so fucking funny because like Mark Levine is like sincerely sort of awed and surprised by everything he says. He was just like, "You're saying you were you were you were doing the crack? You 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 would eat the crack and you would be you'd be high. What's that like?" All right, play it again. Singular right. event again. that started to turn your life around? No, uh, there was a lot of things, but there was just one thing. Then about six months later, my one son, he, uh, we had came back from a hunting trip, and he was in the driveway, and he says, Dad, I can't stay here anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live with my brother. And he's got a tear, and his lips are quivering, and, he's, and, I, and that hit home to me. I'm going, I'm not, I'm not hiding too much from him. Because uh, he, he must have known you were addicted. Yeah, at that, you know, when, they, when the kids were... Uh, from 16 down, they don't remember. They, they, you know, my daughter said one time, she says, you know, we're a very dysfunctional family. I said, that was towards the end. I said, I don't know what that means, but don't say that again. That sounds horrible. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, but I, my son hit me with that. Bad dad and, contest um, you in first in place. In December of 08, something really happened that's very important to my story. My friend came to me, and he was my equal. We had both did cocaine. He was my equal in drug music, In the 1980s yeah. started. We both were functioning addicts throughout the 80s and 90s. 2000, we both switched to crack about the same time. And I heard he had found the Lord and been freed of, of, of these addictions for three years. And he came walking in. I was all by myself, this place out there. I had lot, everything. I'm just a little pulse out there alive and, and within it, with the company and stuff. And he came in and I go, Dick, what are you doing here? And he goes, he goes, the Lord led me here. And I, and I knew he had been straight for three years. I hadn't seen him in a year. And I go, well, as long as you're here, I said, I got some questions for you. I said, first one I asked him, I said, is it boring? He, oh, he said, no, man, it ain't boring. And he's telling me that, you know, questions like, um, you know, how do you feel inside now? You know, how do you, you know, how do you, uh, you know, do you have anything, you know, thinking about the past? Just all different questions, um, you know. But I didn't quit that day. It was another month later. It was January 16, 2009. And I knew that day, it, people say, was that your bottom? Well, for money-wise, I made sure I didn't have any money left, you know, because I knew it would be an incredible story to help people, a story of hope. I, I would always know these things as I, as they were happening. Something bad would happen. They go, oh, that's going to be good in my book someday. <laughs> Jesus. All right, yeah, pause, pause it, pause thinking, it. But All right, well, yeah, uh, you, you get the point. I, I love the idea that um, yeah, his friend shows up and he said, we have like an hour of questions. And then I asked him the most important question of all. Do you have trouble sleeping? And are you interested in a pillow? <laughs> I like that he was like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe my addiction could be an angle. <laughs> yes, my yes. For my story, eventually when I'm on the Mark Levin show, I'll have something to talk about. You know, the, the nightmare for anybody is like, oh, I got booked on a talk show. What am I going to talk about? I got to get some stories. I know. I'll become a crack addict. <laughs> and actually, Mark, all my dealers, they were following your, your small town radio career at the time. And they said, one day, Mark Levin, he's going to be the guy that everyone goes to. And we want you on that show. Didn't we see Mark Levin at CPAC? Did we see him speak? We did. Oh, he no, was electrifying. No, Trump, Trump, Trump shouted out Mark Levin from, from the stage. He was like, Mark's here. Look, Mark's hi, here. Hi. Hi, Mark. <laughs> he loves yeah, me. Trump, 
Trump <laughs> bragged. Uh, Trump bragged about passing like Mark Levin's like personal history quizzes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that was it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Levin was one of those like hate rabid anti Trump guys for a long time, I think. And then it was he had to do the uh the suicide pill. But the beauty yeah, is the last and the, but I think a lot of these guys realize, especially if they're high enough profile or they get to meet him, oh, like this is the easiest thing in the world, talking to this guy. You just kiss his right. ass and then just explain things like you would to a child, and then he just <laughs> accepts them because he doesn't know any better. <laughs> wow, I mean, amazing. Are you telling me that the the founding fathers uh, were the first entrepreneurs. This is amazing. Mark Levin, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that. Now I know it. Yeah. Uh, and no one you... knew that. And no one knew that. And now we know. <laughs> no, I love, yeah, I love the idea of Trump, like, Mark Levin slipping in sort of like a conservative version of Schoolhouse Rock <laughs> into, the, into the Air Force One TVs. <laughs> Trump being like, did you know that a bill gets ratified? There's got to yeah, be I, lots I, I of like, porno and people being blown up like, you know, Cobra from uh, Sylvester <laughs> Stallone movies kind of interjected into all that stuff for him. Yeah, the Trump, yeah, the Trump Oval Office, like VCR, he probably has like... He still has a VCR, love, obviously. Love, weird love of VCRs, but he's like, yeah, just like every action movie ever made in South Africa during apartheid <laughs> i know i know we've talked about it before like, but one of my absolute favorite donald trump stories was the thing about how him and don jr would watch blood sport but only like fast forwarded only to the fighting scene yes. yeah they, were, they, they couldn't wait just like all that all the plot was just get rid of that he just they just want to see kumite that's it well yeah blood sport it's probably the best adaptation of a tolstoy book into film <laughs> But it's just like like all those things. It's like a little dense at times. I get it. All right. Well, uh, Tim, thank you so much for uh, being our our April Fool on this this somber uh, April Fool's Day. But uh, you got a you got a, a new thing out on uh, Adult Swim with Eric right now, right? We have yes. Beef House is airing on Adult Swim. It's a if the tagline that we have is a, it's a sitcom but funny. <laughs> Which is very mean. <laughs> we put that. We put a. They, they put a billboard up there in Hollywood with that on it, and I feel like it's like pretty mean. You know, a lot of people <laughs> driving around working on sitcoms, but uh, it's very fun. And we are back doing a um, little competition for you boys. We're doing Office Hours. We're back in business. Office Hours live um, every 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 day, as much as we can. Not every day. Once a week. So we'd love to have maybe one of you guys on. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how that would work. You know, you'd have to draw straws or something. Fight to the yeah, death. We'll, you guys would be no problem. Yeah. Whoever wants to. Whoever wants well, to we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, uh, here's how we'll do it. Me, Matt, and Felix. We'll see who can smoke crack the longest yeah. and stay up without sleeping. <laughs> who becomes the best crack smoker? <laughs> Why don't you? Yeah, we craft. Somebody craft craft up a redemption story that involves drugs and bedding supplies, and whoever has the most <laughs> compelling one. We'll have you on to tell your tale. Excellent. <laughs> Simply wonderful. And that I, sounds like a deal. <laughs> Tim, I, 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 I got to ask for my own edification. Uh, when is On Cinema coming back? Um, well, as, as soon as the clouds lift, I think. We, yeah. We don't have anything in the can. The last thing we did was the Oscar specials, the seventh Oscar special. Um, and so we usually are, are off doing other things during this period, but we, we got the green we got the go ahead to make another season but that came basically the same week as uh, no no one's ever going to work again so uh, <laughs> i think we well, have to um figure out once once we uh once we can get back into the same room together we'll have one probably hopefully by the end of the year hopefully by uh by Thanksgiving, wouldn't that be beautiful oh, <laughs> to have the cinema <laughs> for the Thanksgiving yeah. with the chick tickies Folks, we need Greg. We love him. Get him back with his VHS tapes. He loves he, him. He's the most, he's the expert, the world expert at cinema, folks. He knows more oh. about movies than anyone in the world. I would pay Anthony Amatek, I don't know, $1,000 to give me a five-minute Trump on, on cinema. That would be unbelievable. <laughs> oh, that'd that'd be yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me, you guys. Uh, please stay safe, and you guys are right in the middle of the uh, yeah, the yeah. hot zone. Yeah, so hot zone. Please be safe. Well, we're staying Take indoors, care. Tim. Yeah. All right. All the yeah, best. Uh, same to you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah.